I wanted to talk in our, it's anything goes summer and, you know, any, any, any topic that you think is, uh, you know, worthy of discussion, we can consider. But I, I have a stack here of things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, and, uh, you know, from, from fossil fuel sub subsidies to, to flame retardants to job numbers. Well, in fact, let's start there. In fact, I, you know, in, in fact, what I'd like to do for this first hour and, and get your input on this as well is define the American dream. What is the American dream? What does the American dream mean to you? Robert Schiller, the uh, economist, wrote a piece for the New York Times uh, from uh, August 4th. What was it, last uh, Thursday or Friday? And it's titled The Transformation of the American Dream. And he basically, you know, uh, Donald Trump made this uh, back in January in a speech. He said, you know, the American dream is back. What does he mean by that? There's no longer a black guy in the White House? Is that what he means? Um, actually, Schiller doesn't even ask that question. I ask it. Back in the 30s, Schiller points out, the American dream did not mean what Trump and Ben Carson, the head of, the, uh, of housing and urban development, have alleged or have said that it means. Basically, Trump and Ben Carson have said that the American dream means uh, that you, the average person can buy a home and start a business. You can be an entrepreneur. Well, very few of us actually want to be entrepreneurs I mean, or can successfully be entrepreneurs. Uh, most people would just like a good job that pays well, that fulfills them, that gives them some sense of satisfaction in the workplace, some sense of control over their lives. Um, but, you know, back in the 30s, and this is, this is just fascinating, back in the 1930s, uh, according to Robert Schiller, the American dream meant freedom, mutual respect, and equality of opportunities. Which is kind of ironic, because in the 30s, we were living in an apartheid society. So, I guess at least for white people, that's what the American dream meant back in the 1930s. It had, uh, Schiller writes, it had more to do with morality than material success. He says the, 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 the definition of the American dream is important and consequential because it represents our core values. And then out of those values, once we've defined our core values, out of those values comes government decisions on housing, government decisions on regulation, government decisions on things like mortgage guarantees, and you know all these kinds of things. And if you define the American dream as, hey, I can get a bigger, better house, then your government policy would all be toward oriented, oriented toward helping people get houses, for example, as was the case during the George W. Bush administration. During the George W. Bush administration, uh, he signed a piece of legislation in 2003 called the American Dream Down Payment Act. And what it did was it reduced the amount of, uh, of, an, of down payment that you had to make on a house making it easier for subprime buyer, 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 borrowers or people who really are just kind of on the edge of, should you buy a house or not? Can you really afford to buy a house or not? Are you buying a house and if you get sick or you lose your job, you know, you're going to lose it. I mean, you know, all these kind of things that made it easier for people to get into houses starting in 2003. And we saw where that led in 2008 when the housing market collapsed, the whole bubble fell in on top of itself. In fact, Forbes magazine got into the act. This year, they've got this thing that they call the American Dream Index, which is a measure of basically, to quote Schiller again, material prosperity, bankruptcies, building, building permits, entrepreneurship, goods producing employment, labor participation rate, layoffs, and unemployment claims. And Schiller notes, this is very different from the original spirit of the American Dream. The original spirit of the American dream was laid out by a writer by the name of James Truslow Adams in 1931. He wrote a book called The Epic of America. I would argue that you could take the American dream back to, uh, back to, de, to Alexis de Tocqueville, 1838, as I recall. It might, might, might have been 1836. Uh, he published a book called Democracy in America. He was a French aristocrat. He came over here spent six months traveling around uh, the East, East Coast and got as far west as Tennessee, I believe. And 
uh, came over basically to prove to himself that a country without a, a ruling class, a ruling elite, could not work. And instead, he came to the opposite conclusion. He was quite blown away by it. I, I read this book back in the late 1990s for the very first time. I was familiar with it from high school, but uh, when I was writing What Would Jefferson Do, um, I, I, I read de Tocqueville's book. And, and in fact, actually, a chapter from his book became a chapter or was the basis of a chapter in my book, Unequal Protection. And de Tocqueville essentially talked about the American dream as one in which every American had a certain baseline of education, information, and political power. Now, again, he was talking about white people, but he was talking, you know, he, he, he literally would walk up to farmers in their fields. This is what so blew Alexis de Tocqueville's mind. This is, again, keep in mind, in the 1830s, Thomas Jefferson had just died Andrew Jackson, I, I'm guessing, probably was president. I'm um, not sure who exactly it would have been, but, it, you know, it's uh, have to go back and look at the order of them. But, but that, you know, it was that era. I mean, it was, this was this was post-founding of the country, but pre-Industrial Revolution. It was just, you know, the steam engine was just starting to catch hold, right? The, there was not a transcontinental railroad. That came with Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War in the 1860s. The Golden Spike was in 1867, as I recall, where the two... Two railroads from the east to west coast met each other. So, but in this book, The Epic of America, James Truslow Adams said, the American dream is not a dream of motor cars and high wages, but a dream of a social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and recognized by others for what they are. In other words, opportunity to achieve, opportunity to be all you can, opportunity to be who you are. He says, by the 1950s, shortly after World War II and the triumph against fascism, the American dream was still about freedom and equality. So the American dream, basically from the founding of the Republic up until the 1950s, and in the 1960s, the American dream was deeply rooted in this idea of morality and virtue and value and opportunity. Um, as, uh, you know, as its principal proponent at the time, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in his I Have a Dream speech in 1963, in fact, in that speech, he talked about a vision that, quote, was root, deeply rooted in the American dream, end quote. So right up until the 60s, the American dream was about a, mo a morality, essentially, and government policies that would promote that morality. In 1944, President Franklin Roosevelt said, you know, he proposed his Economic Bill of Rights, the second Bill of Rights, and it had six items. Every American, and, and he wanted this in the Constitution as a right, which means that if the private economy, if capitalism fails to provide it, then the government does. So number one, a job. So the government became the employer of last resort. And that's exactly what happened with the WPA, the CCC, and all these other uh, you know, acronym agencies that FDR started. Number two, an adequate wage and decent living. He did that with minimum wage laws and, and strength of unionization. Number three, a decent home. Well, that was echoed by George W. Bush in 2003, although, you know, it became more aspirational. I, I would say that the major place for the American dream flipped was in the 80s, when Reagan essentially said that the, the American dream is not, is not having a happy life, it's having a prosperous life, that money came to define everything. And we've basically been stuck there ever since. Okay, back to the second Bill of Rights, FDRs. Number four, something that every, a right that every American should be entitled to. And it, it blows my mind that, uh, you know, reading Paul Krugman's column in today's New York Times, the Democratic Party is still arguing about this. In 1944, the most popular Democratic president in the history of the United States, who was elected to four terms as president of the United States, said the fourth right that we should all have is the right to medical care. Number five, economic protection during sickness, accident, old age, or unemployment. In other words, a strong social safety net, unemployment insurance, social security. And number six, a good education, free schools, free colleges. Now, this was in 1944 that Franklin Roosevelt defined the American dream in these terms. So what does the American dream mean to you? What does it mean to all of us? 
I think one of the biggest differences between Democrats and Republicans is their view of the American dream. Increasingly, the Republican view of the American dream is empowered white people and lots and lots of riches. Oh, and the oligarchs getting more and more and more, and the regulations going away so that the oligarchs get even richer. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Meanwhile, Democrats are trying to define the American dream in terms of egalitarianism and a return to the values of FDR. Where do you stand? We're talking about the American dream, and what does this mean? Right? What, and, 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 and what does it mean to you? Omar uh, called during the break, and he was talking about how he was, he's an immigrant to the United States, and, and, the American, and, and many people outside the United States talk about the American dream as meaning one of two things principally. One, that you're not going to be selectively prosecuted because you've offended the government. Um, it's, uh, and this isn't his example, this is mine, but for example, in China, and I'm not sure if this is still the case, this was very much the case a decade ago, um, it was illegal to move without the permission of the police. And yet, for mostly economic opportunity, but sometimes just even government would come in and build a new city and say to the farmers, you got to move. You know, some massive proportion of the population had moved, at least the urban population, had moved in the last couple of years without police permission, which left pretty much everybody in a situation where if they upset the authorities, they could be arrested for moving without police permission and end up in jail for a few years. And it goes kind of beyond that. I mean, here in the United States, and this is the, the hell, the personal hell that Donald Trump is going to be living through, you know, the old, the old joke that a grand jury can indict a ham sandwich um, may well be true. And we're going to find out if Donald Trump is a ham sandwich. But uh, the fact of the matter is, in the United States, if, if they decide they're going to take you out, it, it can happen. It's just not routine. It's not the norm. Where it's, it's absolutely the norm in countries like Saudi Arabia, for example. You've got these uh, young people. It's, uh, what, 14, I believe it is, young people who are all, who are all just sentenced to death by the Saudi government by, to beheading because in 2011, when the Arab Spring was happening, there was a big demonstration in, in Saudi Arabia calling for democracy. And these people showed up at the demonstration and they were Shia. They were Shiite uh, Muslims. And Saudi Arabia, of course, is run by a, a Sunni dictatorship, a monarchy. So um, fail, freedom from capricious prosecution is the American dream in the minds of some people. And then on the other hand, freedom to, uh, for, to have opportunity based on merit rather than relationship. Another thing that Omar pointed out, that in other countries, you get a job with the government, you get a contract with the government because your brother-in-law is a member of the royal family or because you're good friends with somebody who's, who's uh, you know, a high up bureaucrat. In other words, it's all cronyism, right? It's all, it's all bakshish. So, uh, you know, you've got that. Uh, as the American dream. The other part is, you know, having a good job. And by the way, apropos of that, there's a fascinating article over at the, the IWB website um, titled, Continue to Beware the Job Numbers. Is it the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Bureau of Line Statistics? And I, I realize, and this is, this guy talks about his own, this is his own economics blog and why did he do it? But, you know, uh, Trump is, trumpeting the fact that uh, 209,000 jobs were gained in July. Did you know that in terms of full-time jobs, we actually lost 54,000 jobs in July? Which means that the balance was all part-time jobs. Part-time jobs saw a huge increase in July. Now, how many of those were full-time jobs becoming part-time jobs? How many of those... And those part-time jobs are mostly things like, you know, in healthcare or in uh, it basically services industry, healthcare or restaurants or bartenders. And wages were up, but in those fields, the average pay is around 13 bucks an hour. So if people are making 1350, big whoop, right? So when you actually dig in, as they did over on the Zero Hedge site, if you actually dig into these numbers. Uh, you see that, uh, yeah, the average wage in the hospitality sector is $13.35. Um, we're, we're looking at 20,000 retail stores closing their doors in the first half of this year. That's pretty mind-boggling. Amazon.com, no doubt, played a major role in that, as does Walmart. 
It's going to be interesting to see if Amazon takes down Walmart. But what does that mean for the American dream? What does that mean for your idea of the American dream? What does that mean for how we should pursue public policy to give everybody access to the American dream? I think it's all found in FDR's second Bill of Rights. I'd love to hear you. I'll take your calls after. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 202-808-9925. Well, Trump is off playing golf. I don't know. Maybe that's his idea of the American dream. Hey, I can play golf for 17 days. Uh, we're trying to figure it out.